a very familiar passage that we all um, understand. It's, it's central to what we do uh, as grace believers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the rightly dividing part of that passage, you know, a lot of ministries that on TV, they use that verse, but they don't have a clue what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. But right division, again, it's not an end, but it's, it's the means whereby we can go in, use those keys of right division to unlock the word of God. And why is it so important to be able to study uh, our, the word of God rightly divided? Uh, and that's because in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, in verse 3, as we've, we've heard this verse this, this weekend several times, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, and, that's not the end, salvation isn't the end, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And coming unto the knowledge of the truth, we have to, the only way you're going to come into the knowledge of the truth is by rightly diverting, dividing the Word of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. It's important that once we are saved, be established in the Word of God. Being established. Um, the, there's a little book that you've seen it, a uh, red paperback book that Tom Bruchet uh, authored. And my understanding is it's, a lot of it comes from Grace School of the Bible going through the book of Romans, chapter 3 primarily and chapter 4. There are terms in those two chapters of Romans. Paul said he wrote Romans to establish us, to establish the Roman churches. And we have, we're, we're, you know, the Lord blessed us with, with a book that the, the Apostle Paul wrote 16 chapters to write to the churches in Rome to establish them. So we have that. Uh, and in chapters 3 and 4, those terms, justification, sanctification, imputation, uh, those are terms, um, the righteousness of God, several terms that it's helpful to understand that those don't all mean the same thing. Uh, they're not, I, I know a lot of times for us as believers, we'll gloss over certain words thinking, you know, that we owe oh, that salvation. And we just stop there with our thinking when we're reading the the. the, the the statement that the apostles making, but we need to we need to think about those terms because they unlock different doctrines. That as you un come to understand them, you can appreciate the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross accomplished so much. And the moment you trust the gospel, all those things happen. Uh, you're identified by the Holy Spirit with Christ um, in His death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, that's the redemptive work, being identified with Him. His redemptive work, the blood that He shed at Calvary, is applied to us. When He died, we died with Him. When He was buried, we were buried with Him. When He was raised, we were raised with Him. All those, uh, the, 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 what He accomplished on the cross is not applied to any, no aspect of salvation, including the forgiveness of sins, is applied to anyone until they trust Christ died to pay for their sins. And that's when God the Holy Spirit takes us out of out. Adam, Adam spiritually and puts us in Christ, identifies us with Christ. And in Christ, all those redemptive work of Christ is applied to us. So having our sins paid for, uh, the, the righteousness of God is applied to us. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. <clears throat> Being made the righteousness of God, God's justice could declare us righteous before the universe. This, as he, he said in Matthew 3, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He declares before the universe, these saints who've trusted in my son, they're in my son, and, and God declares us righteous in Christ. And being declared righteous is another way of saying justified. We're declared righteous by, by the judge of the universe. He says we're righteous because he sees us in his son. And with that, again, God not imputing our sins to us, God imputing his righteousness to us. He sanctified us in Christ. He set us apart in Christ as holy unto himself. He sees us in his son. We're accepted in the beloved. And so that happens in your learning. What we're learning when we're established, that little red book, Dictionary of the Gospel. Again, if you read that book, you're going to understand those terms and it's going to allow that your, the assurance of your salvation 
eternal security to be meaningful to you. You will appreciate why it is that you're saved and you can't lose your salvation. You'll appreciate it's because God the Holy Spirit has sealed me in Christ. And He sees me as my spiritual nature, not the failings of my flesh. And when I stand before God and walk before Him, He indwells me. His Spirit's living in me. And I'm the temple of God the Holy Spirit and the Godhead indwells. And learning those things help you appreciate how great your salvation is. And those are the, the doctrines, the salvation doctrines being established in the faith. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his grace, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. So the Apostle Paul's prayer as... as um, Brother R.L. went through the prayers uh, that the Apostle Paul prayed. This is the, one of the prayers for edification. And his desire is to see that all saints be come unto that knowledge of the truth, be established, and understand the riches of God's glory, and to be strengthened with might. And that's what we want spiritually. We want that power of God to be working in us. We want to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. How many uh, charismatic people, they talk about the power of God. They want the power of God. They, you know, they try to pray it down. They try to sense it and feel it. This is, this, it only comes from you trusting the words of this book and them working effectually in you when you believe them, when you trust them, when you take the dare to walk, say, I'm going to believe these, these scriptures that God tells me is true of me. I'm going to believe them. I'm going to agree with God and believe them to be true. And I'm going to put them to, to, to the test in my life. Life, whenever discouragement and trouble comes, I'm just going to rest in these things to be true. I'm just going to believe that God is right when He says, this is what He's made me. And when you take God at His word, that's what faith is. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're just agreeing that God's word to you is right. And again, if you didn't rightly divide, you might take God's instruction to Israel as true for you. And it's not truth for you. And what, what happens, it's truth, it's just truth to someone else. God, that's Israel's program. But when you take Romans through Philemon, where the truth is to you, and you believe it, and take those things by faith, and believe them to be true, and put that to the test in your life when trouble comes, you'll see that God will show you His grace is sufficient in the details of your life. He will comfort, strengthen you. He will give you joy and rejoicing in tribulation. And these things are proven as you put them to work in your life. And that was Paul's prayer for everyone that, to the Ephesians here in, in verse 16. To be strengthened with might by His Spirit in their inner man. We're talking about spiritual fruit eventually this morning. Uh, and I'm just trying to get us a quick review up front to get us to the place where we're going to make the application of, apply, of, of how it is that we... Uh, the fruit of the Spirit are born in our, in our walk as believers. And verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You remember we, we heard this weekend about the, the temple of God. Uh, Greg talk, talked about that a little bit um, when he went back, and, and uh, Richard talked about it this weekend. And, and that there's that edifice of doctrine. Frank talked about it, that edifice of doctrine that's, that God is building into our soul, that His Word, that edifice is built with truth, being built. You have the foundation laid. That's being established, the Romans doctrine. And then layers of doctrine on top of layers. It's building courses like a house is built. And that edifice of doctrine, God the Holy Spirit, we, we, our soul can, can take refuge in the truth of God's Word and get, take comfort from the storms and, and find strength and shelter and peace. And, and from that doctrine as it's built in our soul that Christ may dwell in your hearts. How does He dwell there? Through His Word indwelling us. Through us taking in His Word, accessing it by faith, God the Holy Spirit making it effectually work in us, and that's the dynamic. It's the Word of God and God the Holy Spirit working in harmony in our lives. But that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, again, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able 
to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And again, the power that works in us is God's Word, God the Holy Spirit, the, taking the spiritual words of this book and making them true in our lives. It's His job to do that, by the way. It's not your job to make those things live in you. It's not your job to try to make them work in your life. That's God the Holy Spirit's job. Your job is just to say, you know, God says all, what I need to do is build this truth into, into my soul. Just take it in, read it. Like Richard was talking about the reading plan, three chapters a day and 29 days. I think he said that you'd go through all of Paul's epistles 28 days. Um, you know, that, that's the process of just going through Paul's epistles and taking the doctrine in. Um, go to John chapter 15. So learning, you know, that the, the Christ may dwell in your hearts, that you're being rooted and grounded in love, that you might know the love of Christ. The first year of being established as a believer, the first priority is to study, to find out who and what God's made you in His Son. That's getting established, the foundational truth, but you're learning God's love for you. And as, as Richard mentioned yesterday, uh, that it's the, the, the greatest example of God's love is where? Or was it demonstrated? On the cross. And it's always run to the cross, he said. Go to the cross. That's the answer. If you're, if you're feeling like your circumstances are overwhelming you, things in life are too difficult and tumultuous in your life, go to the cross. Does God love you? Yes. He, he went to the cross to die for you that he might take care of your worst case scenario. Take hell off, off the table as a concern in your life, condemnation for your sins for eternity. Take that off the table. Make it possible for you to have his spirit indwelling you. Take the spiritual words of his book and empower you with them so that you can have his strength to deal with your consequences of, uh, of sin, con bad decisions in your life, trouble that comes from just living in a sin-cursed world day by day. And know the love of God. Know, know what He accomplished for you through the cross to equip you for living now and in eternity in, in the ages to come. Um, John chapter 15. Um, I'll try to get there. <clears throat> Verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. This was uh, the evening before he went to the cross. He's, he's talking with his disciples. He's going through, these, uh, going through this discourse that John records. Uh, and, he, and he tells them, no man loves you any more than the person willing to lay down his life for you. And what was he about to do for them? He was about to do that for them. Did they understand the cross before Christ went to the cross? Did, were they all, were the, were the eleven there uh, at the sepulcher waiting to see the, the resurrection of Christ, come at, that Christ would come out of that tomb and it'd be empty? No. Were they in disbelief when, when it, that tomb was empty and they found it that way? Mary, hey, the tomb's empty. You know, they didn't believe her. Uh, the, the, what, what's the point? The point is that Christ was trying to prepare them that what He was doing, the Holy Spirit would bring these things to remembrance for them and they would understand and appreciate what He, what he had accomplished was His intention to go to the cross and die for them. He laid down His life for us. Um, Romans 5.8 says, God commended His love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Apostle Paul takes that truth and, and applies it to us in our, in our understanding. Being established is understanding the love of God, the love that you are loved. You are accepted in the Beloved. God loves you as He loves His beloved Son. You are loved of God. And we need to appreciate that because God's going to use that to bear spiritual fruit in you. God's going to use that to change your life. God wants you to walk in the awareness of His love for you. I think sometimes, in my case, I thought dwelling on those things seemed kind of selfish. That I just want to find out all the things that God did for me, 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 right? And I thought, you know, that, that can't be God's will for me just to think about what He did for me. But then you, you come to understand and appreciate it's bigger than that. 
He did that for me. He's done it for everyone. And he wants to, he, he died for us to give his life to us that he can live his life through us. And it's through that process of learning it ourselves, you're not ready to share with anyone else what God has done for them until you understand it and eternalize it. And until it produces the motivation, the desire for you to tell someone else about it, because it is the greatest message the world's ever heard. And it is what everybody needs. It's what we need. You know, it's funny, we, we as preachers will get up here and preach these things to you like it's so obvious and why doesn't everybody get this? And we understand it by reading and studying it, but we don't always apply it in every moment of our day, and we should. So it's, it's, we, we're preaching to ourselves when we get up here and preach these things, but you know, it is the message that has power uh, that, that we all need uh, and to walk in and, and appreciate and renew our mind in day by day. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, <clears throat> talking about the love of God for us, for He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God loves you, and He sent His Son that He might make you the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, His righteousness, you might be made righteous in you. Ephesians 1.13, And the, mo the moment you also trusted uh, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. Um, God the Holy Spirit makes the gospel effectually work in you. And, and He ad identified your believing spirit with the Spirit of Christ. And in Christ, God identified you with Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. When Christ died, you died with Him. The blood of Christ washed away your sins. You were buried with Christ, raised to walk in, in newness of life with Him. God saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, that's part of the establishment process. That's Romans, chapters, um, Romans chapter 8, particularly, uh, that the Holy Spirit indwells us. The, the purpose in saving you was that, that God could take up His life in you. You remember in the Old Testament, they wanted to build Him a temple to live in. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm a spiritual God. I don't live in a little stone building. I want you to appreciate, I want to live in you. And, and that's always been plan A for the Lord. Is to, to, his redemptive plan is, has to do with him joining us with his spirit so that he can save us, make us righteous, so that we can live with him for eternity, that we can be a part of what he's doing in the glorification of his son. That's plan A. And that's always been God's purpose. He, he didn't want to live in their building in town. He wanted to take up, he wanted to be in them. He wanted to, his spirit to live in, he wanted them to walk with him. He wanted to be in their lives. He didn't just want to live down the street in a building. And I want to talk to you today about the fruit of the spirit. God loves you. He's given his life for you, again, so that he could live his life uh, through you, God wants you to be fruitful and multiply spiritually. Okay, He wants you to, to be fruitful and that the spiritual fruit of His Word can, live, can be born through you. And He wants you to share that truth with others so that there can be more uh, uh, believers who are saved by His grace that he's able to help save them from the power of sin in their daily walk and help them to deal with the tribulation and circumstances of life they're going through and that they can bear fruit and that they can be part of the glorification of his son that they can live with him with eternal glory and but god the holy spirit doesn't work apart from the spiritual words of this book does he and I know you've heard us say that. I mean, that's something you've heard before. But the Word of God doesn't work apart from God the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <coughs> Verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath 
revealed them, like Greg was talking about, God hath revealed them unto us by how? By His Spirit. You know, you read over in John how He's going to send the Comforter and He's going to teach you all things. God reveals the truth of God's, His, His Word, the living words. This, this Word, the, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even, dividing of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. God the Holy Spirit uses this book. This book is alive. It reads us when we read it. And it's not like a, a, a book that, written by a man. This, this is the Word of God that effectually works in us when we believe it. And he says, um, verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man that is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit, small s, Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that's the Word of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost, notice, teacheth. How do you learn when you study the Word of God? God the Holy Spirit is teaching you. You know, it, it's important to, to hear the Word of God preached, but when you have the Holy Spirit on board, when you sit down with your Bible, you open it up, and He takes line upon line, precept upon precept. He teaches you truth, layers that, couples that with another verse, and He teaches you comparing spiritual things with spiritual, comparing verse with verse. You can come to understand and appreciate the wisdom of God. And what's He say uh, in verse 16? For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Do you know the mind of the Lord? He said, Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have what? The mind of Christ. We, in written form, we have the mind of Christ. And God's goal and purpose in, to establish us all is that he can give us his thinking about our circumstances. He can help us to value and esteem the things that he values and esteems. And God's a, a, a gentleman. He doesn't force his wisdom into your mind. He doesn't force you to have his attitudes. But if you want to know them, he'll teach you verse by verse and help you to understand and appreciate the way he thinks about things. And it's far superior than our way. And there's liberty and freedom in his way of thinking. And he helps us to be the best us that we can be. And it's not taking any way from who you are. It's helping you to be free to be who He's made you to be in His Son. So it's helping you appreciate and, and, and realize His joy and His peace. That he, and that's what we all want, is His joy and His peace. We want to be the best personal adjustment that we can be. And that's what He wants for us. He wants us to have joy uh, through His Word. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse thir uh, 13, it's been, we do quote it a lot, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. So Paul's thinking, you know, what, is, what, do you, what did he tell us to do without thinking or without ceasing? <laughs> without thinking. No, you, you're to pray with the understanding. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to be confused by that statement. Uh, R.L. told us that we're to pray without ceasing, right? And he says, for this cause we thank God without ceasing. Okay. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, again, rightly divided, the importance of rightly dividing, you received it not as the word of men, Oh, that's just a book written by men. <laughs> You're not to receive it as, yeah, God used men as a, uh, like whenever you dictate, you know, they're, uh, they're, they, have, they use these little tapes for, uh, with a dictaphone now or a trend to scram for the transcriptionist to type out what the person says on the tape. They, they're not going to alter and change it. Oh, he could have said it better this way. You know, I'll just fix that, what he said. No, you, they transcribe exactly what the person says on the tape. And, and that's the way the, 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 the men that God inspired to write the Word of God, they, he wrote down the words that 
they wrote the words that God gave them to write, and God caused them to write down His word verbatim what God said. And the verse says, "When you received the word of God, you heard it, uh, which you heard of us. You received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe." Now that's that's a truth. It's one of those truths that takes a while to really think about, rum, ruminate, um, marinate in your mind, and make you appreciate what it means that God's Word effectually works in me when I believe it. Does it work in you when you, when you think, oh, you know, yeah, I, I, I know that verse. But are you accessing it by faith? Are you letting it work in you? Well, that's what it means to let it effectually work in you when you trust it in your life and your situations. You honor God by believing His Word in all those areas of your life. And so we're, that's what God was, or the Apostle Paul is thanking God for the Thessalonians. Um, Brother Elvis told me, you know, something in the back room there. He said, you know, Paul didn't thank the people that he writes to. He thanked God for the people. And you know that that's important, isn't it? Uh, that we we be we thank the Lord for the things that Paul was thanking God for the Thessalonians that they they did this and they 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 allowed they walked in the Word of God as he did that mutual faith of of Paul that he shares with them and they were accessing it by faith in their walk and it was living in them producing fruit in them as God would have for us all to allow God's Word to produce spiritual fruit in us. Um, look, you know, again, Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. 2, Timothy, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to see the Word of God doesn't work apart from the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't work apart from the Word of God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, here's an example and of many, many examples of that in the Word of God. But... But we were bound to give thank always to God for you. Thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to sanctification through, through or to salvation, I'm sorry. Notice what it says. Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now that's the gospel. So the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. The, God the Holy Spirit calls us, God calls us to salvation, verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God calls you, and when you respond in faith to his word, then you're one of the chosen. You know, that's not the election the way it's taught by religion, that God has a certain number of people he's chosen, and he gives them the grace to believe his word when they hear it. And that's, that's intervention, God causing a, the chosen ones to believe it. That's not that at all. God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. And the call goes out to everyone. But those who respond are those who are chosen to be identified with His Son. They, they the elect, are those who elected to trust the gospel. And they're elect because God, in His redemptive plan, purposed, that all those who believe Him and His truth trust in Him for eternal life and salvation in the various programs in the Word of God, God would save by the redemptive work of Christ and identifying them with His Son. Whereunto He called you by our gospel. But that's, again, God chose us to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And our walk as believers, fruit-bearing, has more to do with, in our practical sanctification, the application of God's Word in our thinking, in our details of our life, God uses His Word to produce the mind of Christ to bear fruit in us. And, but it's, God can't accomplish that without His Word in us, and God, the Holy Spirit, using His Word to, to effectually work in us. And it's through a process of taking in the Word of God and God, the Holy Spirit, making it work in us and through us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, 
goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, and they, do, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, against such there is no law. You know, those Ten Commandments could all be fulfilled with these, with these things mentioned in the passage. In fact, the love is the fulfilling of the law, isn't it? And so the, the, why would you want to take what belongs to, to your neighbor if you love your neighbor as God loves him? Why would you do anything that was belonged to that neighbor, take anything away from them if, if you loved that neighbor and, and as God loves them? And you realize that God, Christ died for them. You know, and you, you love them the way God loves them, values and esteems. And the same with God. You, would, you, you wouldn't take God for granted. You wouldn't want to uh, worship other gods if you loved Him. So love is the fulfilling of the law, to put the value and esteem there that God has uh, for those things. And each one of those fruit that we just read there is an example of the Spirit of God taking control of your life and producing the life of Christ in you. Spiritual fruit looks like this description of things in your life. And it's the result of Christ dwelling in us richly. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry, it's the result of the Word of Christ dwelling in us richly. Okay? And it's all based on sound doctrine. And that's why, again, 2 Timothy 2.15 is so important to be established that we can access by faith the things, the access by faith the grace God has given us to stand in, our positional standing in Christ, access that in the circumstances of our life. Um, go to Ephesians chapter 5. I, uh, Hold on to Ephesians 5, and I'm going to ask you to come back with me to Galatians 5. wanted to make a quick point here. I'm back in Galatians 5. <clears throat> the uh, fruit of the Spirit are listed there. And if you uh, look at verse 13 of Galatians 5, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. We have liberty. We're free from the bondage of, of religion, free from the bondage to sin. God's given us liberty. We have a free will. We're not put under the law, under the bondage of the law. We have liberty under grace. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Do you see that happen to a lot of grace believers? They learn about the liberty that they have in Christ, right? They're free from the bondage of legalism and religion, and it's God doesn't save you by what you do. He saves you by what Christ accomplished. So in Christ you're saved. Nothing can take that away from you. So some people who rightly divide think that's a license to just go back to the lifestyle, continue in the lifestyle they lived under. They're saved. They'll be saved so as by fire, but that'll be better than hell, and they're content with that. But there's so much more that God has for us beyond just trusting the gospel that you'd be saved from doing what you, you know, saved from eternity in hell. That's God wanted to save us, put us in His Son, bring glory and honor uh, to Himself uh, by accomplishing our salvation. But He doesn't want us to just live, go back under, continue to walk in the bondage of sin and bear the, the unfruitful works of darkness and, and allow those, those sinful things to control us and for us to be walking in, under the dominion of sin because those things are going to destroy us. And He wants us to have joy. When we walk in the victory that He's given us in His Son, that gives God glory. But when we're saved and we choose to just continue to live under the bondage of sin, it's going to keep working destruction and damage in our life. He doesn't want us to, to be free from jail, but choose to live inside of it and just look through the bars out at the world. He wants you to leave 
the jail and the bondage and the destruction that sin brings. And so he says, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but what? But by love, serve one another. He expects you to appreciate his love, number one, and then when you do, you can share his love with others. Not the kind of love the world has for one another, just uh, an emotionally, emotional phileo love. You know, just, uh, uh, you know, when, when you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you, you know, but if but you, you want to see me storm up on you, you know, be, do something mean to me and, and I'll, ju I'll show you the wrath, you know. That's not the kind of love that God wants us to walk. He wants us to, as God loved us, He wants us to love others unconditionally, show them His unconditional love. So that's a bearing, of, bearing God's fruit. And, and that's what salvation, the understanding of our salvation brings, is that, that understanding of God's love for us, that we can sh you let Him live through us to share His love with others. And the greatest way to show your love for another is to share the gospel with them. You know, you, you, you may not be able to buy them out of all their problems in their life, financially. But you can give them, you know, they, the, the saying, you, you give a man a fish and he's going to be hungry again. But if you show a man how to fish, he'll never hunger again, right? And that's the, the idea, silver and gold have an none, but such as I have, I give you. We have the riches of God's grace to offer the paupers that are, that, are, that are poor in sin and, and impoverished in their soul and spirit, and we can share right division with them, they can access the riches of God's grace, and that, that's the greater love. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed, lest you be consumed one of another. This I say, then walk in the spirit, and ye shall not what? fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is there a battle going on inside of all of us with that flesh wanting to get even and, you know, react in a circumstance with another person and, and <coughs> justify our actions whenever we're accused and, and all those things. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. This I say then, <clears throat> walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the lust of the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. There's a conflict going on inside of you. And the Spirit, uh, and these things are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, how are we led of the Spirit? By the Word of God. He leads, leads us by His Word. His Word tells us that we are the children of God, tells us that He loves us, He's for us, we have, we're at peace with God. Yet you're not under the law. He's not angry with you. He's not trying to teach you a lesson when you mess up, get off the path. God isn't trying to chastise you, use circumstances to correct your behavior. He's not dealing with this that way. Now the works of the flesh are these, and you could say the fruit of the flesh is this. This is the fruit of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and the such like. By the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things, what? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that verse is not saying that if you bear the fruit of your flesh, you're not going to go to heaven. Okay? What that verse is saying is, those are the things that lost people are going to be judged for in hell. Amen. Okay, Christ you know, reconciled the world on himself, but doesn't mean everybody's forgiven. Because unless they trust in Christ as their Savior, the, the benefits of Christ's redemptive work on the cross, His blood to cleanse and wash away sins, aren't implied or applied to a believer until they trust the gospel and God the Holy Spirit identifies them with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. Right? But, but if that's the way the flesh works when it's law, when, if that's what God's going to judge people for in hell for eternity, and God saved you, and put His Spirit in you, and given you liberty from the power of sin to control you in your walk as a believer, why should you let those things dominate and control you in your life when He's set you free from their dominion? To, so he's, he, this is a, he's, he's appealing to us in this passage, don't just bear the, the fruit of any unsaved person or the fruit that you, uh, of your flesh that, that were 
uh, dominated your life before you got saved. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, verse 22, and that's where we, we began in the passage. Go with me now to Ephesians 5. <clears throat> verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us, and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Savior. <laughs> he's a sweet-smelling Savior, no doubt, but, but he's talking about the cross work, the sacrifice that he made on the cross for us that, that was well-pleasing unto God. God didn't God made him to be sin for us. That he didn't enjoy doing that. That wasn't the part that was well-pleasing. What was well-pleasing is he saw the perfect sacrifice of his son as the payment for the sins of all men, and it, that pleased him, satisfied his wrath against sin. <clears throat> so we are able to understand God's love for us, unconditional. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He loved us when we were his enemies. And so that we can, as he's, we're to lock, walk in love toward others and be followers of God as his dear, dear children and let his life live through us, his mind be formed in us, renew our minds with the truth of his word, allow him to change our attitudes and allow him to change and, and bear fruit through us with his love, with the fruit of the spirit as the word of God lives in us and works in us. Um, now look at... Um, <clears throat> Verse 8, for you were sometimes darkness, <clears throat> now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You have the light of the Word of God. He wants you to live in the light. Don't shrink back into the darkness. Go back behind the bars. Go back into, under the dominion of sin. Be controlled by your tyrannical sin nature. Verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and and righteousness and truth. The fruit of righteousness. Verse, verse 10, proving what is that acceptable, what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Grace doesn't make us free to sin. Amen. It gives us a way not to sin that we didn't have before God <coughs> saved us. Grace gives us liberty from the bondage of sin. We're free. Now we have a choice what we're going to serve. Our sin nature or the Word of God living in our inner man. We're going <coughs> to serve God or we're going to serve sin. And, you know, people say, I'm just a... Sinner saved by grace. You know, you see the bumper stickers. Like that just excuses their sin because they realize they're a sinner. Do you? You know, and that's like, we've, I've come to this high level of understanding. I'm a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. You know, where are you at in your life? You know, do you think you don't sin? And I've, I know, again, those who rightly divide that excuse sin think that grace is an excuse to just manifest their flesh as long as they give the gospel, that's okay. You know, and, and it's not okay. God wants us to walk in the light. He gives us the ability to live above the snake line in our lives. We can manifest His love toward others. He wants to glorify His Son by His Word living in us. Verse um, 14 Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, whereas, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit." Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And he goes on and explains doing that in different relationships. And he says in verse 18, though, 
Wherefore, or 17, be not unwise, but understanding what, the will, what is the will of the Lord. God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. You understand what God is doing. That's what, his, that's what he wants you to walk in light so that you can see how he loves you, what he's made you in, in his son, who and what you are in Christ, so that, that truth can live in you and the mind of Christ can be formed in you, you can be conformed to the image of his son. But he says the way that's going to happen is not to be in control. You know, the wine in verse 18 is a reference to the religious system. The people in religion are drunk with that. And they're blind to the truth of God's word. They can't see the light. They're blinded from the light. And yet we have the light, and the understanding of right division allows us to take, we have the light on God's word, but he doesn't want us to live under control of tradition, legalism, religion, after we've been given liberty in Christ and freed from all that. Instead, he wants us to be under the control, be filled with the Spirit. Um, I've heard Richard say that uh, being filled with the Spirit there isn't getting more of the Spirit. The moment you trust the gospel, you get all the Holy Spirit that you can, you can have. He is, he is a person. He indwells you. you. You don't just get a part of him. It's all of him. He's in you. So it's not getting more. Of the, he says, he's not telling them, be, get more of the Spirit. What he's, but the example that he used, it's like you fill the swimming pool with water. That'd be like saying, be, uh, be filled with the Spirit. But another way of saying it would be fill the pool with, with the hose. Be filled with the hose. Right? Be filled with the Word of God. And the way we know that he's talking about the Word of God here and not telling us to get more of the Holy Spirit, the companion passage we'll look at, and before we close, Colossians chapter 3 is a, is a sister passage, if you will. He says, you know, Paul's talking about the practical, practical application here of living under grace. Uh, we, could, we could go pretty far back and, and cover some great verses, but I'm going to focus here to, for the comparison of Ephesians 5. I want you to just start with me um, in verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Be filled with the Spirit. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Remember, Paul mentioned that in Ephesians 5. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him, and then he goes on with the application, wives, submit to your husbands, just as he did in, in Ephesians 5. So the application, being filled with the Spirit, again, God the Holy Spirit doesn't work apart from the Word of God, and the Word of God doesn't work apart from the Holy, Holy Spirit. And so, turn with me to one more passage, and we'll close. John chapter 15. Again, the Lord covering these truths with the, with the twelve, um, actually the eleven here, before he died. The, Judas has already left the table at this point when he's sharing this with his disciples. And he says in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is a husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. He's, he's talking to saved men. He's not talking about salvation here. He's talking about bearing fruit. He says in verse 3, You're clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. Verse 4, Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. When you remember we read about uh, the word to let the word of Christ dwell in us. 
We're the, the edification, God the Holy Spirit is building the truth of God's Word in our soul, that He lives in it and through His Word. Let the, uh, and He's admonishing them. Uh, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. The Word of God is producing the life of Christ in us. It bears fruit in our lives when we access it by faith. And just as he had admonished his disciples to abide in him, to abide in his word, to abide in the truth that he gave them. And he would bear the, the fruit is born because of the life that comes from the vine. They're not going to bear the fruit. Uh, it's not performance of the disciples that is going to produce the fruit in their ministries. It's them allowing the truth of, of, that the Lord had given them to live through them to bear the fruit. And just as it is, the fruit of the Spirit isn't something that we're going to produce. It's not performance, uh, as religion teaches. You know, the, the verse that, that, that uh, <clears throat> Paul says, he says, uh, don't live, you know, don't be as those who have a form of godliness, but are denying the power thereof. The form of godliness, the form, religion, looks a lot like what we do when we rightly divide the word of truth. They put with their flesh, they're trying to walk in love toward others. And they put on, Paul, uh, the, the Lord rebuked the Pharisees for being like a sepulcher, white on the outside, but inside they're full of dead men's bones. The, the form of religion, you can, you can look good, smell good, um, look great on the outside, but if the heart isn't circumcised, if they haven't trusted in the Lord, if Christ's life isn't living in them and through them, <clears throat> it's not going to, religious deeds aren't going to bring glory to God. And God does, doesn't motivate the, 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 the fruit, the spiritual fruit that we're reading about and studying about this morning. It's not motivating by, motivated by the fear of God. Uh, we're living under the law, performance-based acceptance. Uh, we don't serve the Lord to, to, in order to receive a blessing from God. <clears throat> we let His Word live in us, um, <clears throat> be filled with the Spirit. We're to be filled with the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. And the truth, and the, the truth is going to produce the fruit, the spiritual fruit that, that the Lord wants to bear in us as we, again, we, Christ gave His life for us that He might give His life to us, that He might live His life through us. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the truth of Your Word that lives in us. <clears throat> we thank you that it's the power that works in us when we believe it. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit to help us to <clears throat> deal with the lusts of our flesh, to put it off, that we might be able to yield to the truth of your word, be led of your spirit, walk in the truth, and let it effectually live in, in us and through us. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.